Hello. For the next few minutes, I'd like to talk to you about sustainability, climate change, the impact of COVID, and what does good business really mean? I mean, we're living at a time where many of us are unsure whether we're collectively feeling the crisis or whether it's a kind of mob hysteria caused by being isolated uh, working from home and feeling that somehow there's a revolution afoot simply because of the variety of experience that's been robbed from us, leaving us, if you like, with a strange monoculture of following the seasons as they evolve. Most people watching today will have noticed the spring unfold, followed by summer and now, of course, the autumn. And then we'll possibly think that not since childhood have you ever been so acutely aware of the unfolding of those seasons. Some years ago, I went to the World Sustainable Tourism Conference, or some such title, in Marrakesh. Um, and we all piled into swank hotels and were driven about regally and ate sweetmeats that had been imported from around the world. Um, with an incredibly smug middle-class audience, myself included. I'm not exonerating myself from that. But it was as if climate change and all the accompanying dreads of biodiversity loss, for example, um, were theoretical constructs um, that were a lifestyle choice issue that could be addressed with a bit better marketing. I think we now know better than that. Whereas even as little as two years ago, um, there was some scepticism in some areas about whether climate change was taking place uh, as if it was a debate, a sort of intellectual pursuit. I think you would find those who now would claim there is no climate change would be on a very extreme wing of that argument. So the, the question for all of us having this conversation is what do we mean about sustainability or responsible development? Where do we see the future of our leisure businesses going? And to what degree are we being dishonest with ourselves, knowing that we need a root and a branch approach to change for all of this, rather than uh, just making sure that we tell tourists uh, not to wash their towels so frequently um, and that our food will be much better locally sourced. Last year, um, Bill McDonough, who many of you will know is the um, famous author of a, a book called Cradle to Cradle. He's a, a, a wonderful architect uh, who has in his practice a number of chemists as well as uh, architects, uh, came to talk for the Eden Project at the Royal Society uh, in London. And he started with a, a very cute comment. He, he looked out at the audience and said in his Southern American drawl, he said, if I was to say uh, your relationship with your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend was sustainable, quite how excited would you be? And everybody, of course, laughed. But the truth is sustainability is rather worthy and it doesn't actually capture the excitement of the thinking about regeneration, about actually the opportunity of changing into a green economy is not about a cost to be borne, but it is future profits to be absorbed. It is about uh, understanding that the, the revolutions that are going on globally about whether uh, we're going to have a clean meat revolution, the so-called you know uh, veg vegetarian vegetable meat uh, is going to alter the way we are. I mean, there is a revolution coming. You do know this. When you see some of the fastest moving stocks in the world um, are clean meat, uh, 1.8 billion uh, pound turnover this year alone. Uh, next year, probably double that. Uh, we know that the Chinese market is about to get very interested in this. And suddenly you can imagine global agriculture going through transformations that would just 18 months, two years ago seemed unthinkable. What is it about going to a huge exhibition center and people are talking, uh, uh, it's the dairy, it's the dairy festival, and it's sponsored by almond milk? Ha! <laughs> Look, almonds ain't that sustainable. And at the heart of the discussion about a sustainable leisure industry has got to be a notion 
of where we are going. We've got projects in the Yucatan and in Australia where very large venture funds have bought huge amounts of degraded land. We know how to enrich degraded land with vegetative, um, uh, mixing with vegetative materials, uh, creating the, 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 the better facilities for water porosity, water catchment, water, uh, the proper drainage of it, the soil fertility, the biomass growth, the biodiversity increase, and of course the holy of holies, which is uh, the carbon sequestration, which goes with all of that. So you're looking at large amounts of land that are actually making you money doing nothing if you can just enrich them because of the carbon sequestration on it. But the really interesting discussion is when you see all the people who are currently living in cities who are wanting a leisure experience that is outside a city, and you're starting to see that one of the funny things about the countryside, for example, is the word farm. Farm has stood astride it as a word which has made us think that all that countryside is owned by businesses that are about growing things or about nurturing livestock and so on. And yet the future is going to be that rural experiences are going to include well-run regenerative farms where people go for the experience of being on a farm. Families go to have pattern, shape, the family table made as a part of the ritual of the working day, seeing how food is produced, field to plate, so to speak. Um, the facilities for, uh, for, I was going to say hospitals, I don't mean that, uh, for mental health and well-being are being thought of. And this is not freakery. I'm seeing this wherever I go. In Britain alone, I've been to a dozen places which are taking young people for remedial help by taking them for a week onto a farm, 12 at a time. In China, we understand from the three projects we've got there that there is a huge investment coming in from the Agricultural Bank to get facilities in the countryside which give people the urban, what they thought they wanted a town or a city for, but making it available in the countryside in an ethical, sustainable, environmentally, completely friendly milieu. When you look at the current leisure businesses we have. Here at Eden, we began in reverse by looking at the community we were in, and we asked them whether they wanted us. 20 individual conversations we had. Interestingly, they, they were suspicious of us to start with, but that suspicion soon gave way to an affection when they realized that our plan started to take account of their requirements or their hopes for us, the way we built the road to us which helped the local village, the way we designed that road to make sure that wildlife wasn't going to become part of a process towards roadkill. Um, we actually even persuaded Natural England, the wildlife charity, uh, to become uh, colleagues in designing that road. We basically decided that all of the people who were going to supply us, we were going to talk to them two years before we were open so that they could be ready for our supply. We then offered them long-term contracts to supply us. Why? Because if you want to use capitalism as a weapon for good, let people use your order book as an ability to go to the bank to get a loan to make them grow, to be able to cater for what you will require, or else you're going to find you're going to take all of their output, all of it, in one go, and that doesn't make them resilient either. So we have something like 1,200 local suppliers. We uh, have a scheme which is called waste neutral, which means if our suppliers after 18 months have managed to make themselves go waste neutral and have made their suppliers go waste neutral, we then give them another 18 month contract automatically. This actually is using capitalism as a really weighted um, carrot, if you like, to get the very best environmental behavior. We're now taking Eden, the experience, to the next logical step, which is to see, can we make ourselves a complete recycling unit? Can we make our waste in all its forms cycle internally? Can we, uh, if you like, create that circular economy within the boundaries of Spaceship Eden, inspired by the work of my hero, Buckminster Fuller, who wrote in 1969, um, an operations manual to Spaceship Earth. If you haven't read it, you should read it because actually it tells you an awful lot about what sustainability is. But ultimately where this goes uh, in terms of good business is are you going to continue being less bad 
or are you going to dare to start with the foundation block of your business being about doing good? Eden has just made the decision that it's going to try and do good. We're going to mess up. We're going to mess up terribly along the way. There's no way of getting this perfectly right, is there? But we have felt, we've, or rather we've come to the view in talking to young people and the rest of it, that those of us who run these big businesses, and many of you listening to me speak now, will run far bigger businesses than I do. But you know what? The truth is, in the quiet hours, when you're thinking about what you do, when you're quite self-satisfied by what you've achieved, be aware what you're doing, what I'm doing, is discounting the future. We're pretending the needs of the future are not being impacted by our actions now. But they are, you know. The crap going down our rivers and into the ocean and killing stuff in the ocean. The stuff that's going onto the soil that, to poison things, to make other things grow faster, but making them ever more dependent on the uh, intermediaries that are being poured on the land. The noxious fumes we're putting into the, into the sky that is we know not going to be absorbed successfully unless we do something radical. Leisure should be that. Leisure should be the opportunity to be in nature or feeling your body acting as nature would intend in surroundings that remind you of how good it is to live on this fragile little planet of ours. And you see, the thing is that our influence could be so much bigger than any other business because people, when they go on holiday and they stay with us and they eat with us and they pause to have a bit of relaxation, they're in a bit, they're in a bit of a different mind zone. So if they go to a place they admire and they say that that place that they so admire and that they're having a good time in with their families and loved ones, stands for certain values. Those values will rub off, you know. So we have a duty, all of us have a duty to be self-interested by being long-term interested and being long-term interested means we've got to have a long-term view of how the communities around us would like us to survive a long time into the future and for us to have working practices that will guarantee that we do so. I'm sure this sounds a bit like a polemic of some kind. I was trying not to rant. It's maybe it's the effect of five months of reading a lot of stuff about biodiversity loss and someone making the quip, you know, the next great extinction, but the dinosaurs didn't have a choice. Makes you think, doesn't it? I'll leave you with a thought. One of the things that gets my colleagues pensive is when I say, imagine you walk into a giant room like the Sistine Chapel or a big railway station and imagine that it's been plastered and painted on that ceiling is a fresco of all the descendants of everybody who's currently standing in that station or cathedral or whatever. So you've got all these thousands of faces looking down from, say, 50 years from now. What would those faces what would those people have said to us? Were they able to speak from that distance of time? And what would we have done? Rather, what would we have done differently knowing what they know 50 years from now? It's time for us to stop just being consumers. It's time for us to become global citizens and influencers and learn how to sleep really well at night because we've done the right thing. You know I'm right. Anyway, good luck to all of us. I believe our industry's got a very, very bright future, and I believe that philosophically, we're very important agents of change. So let's go to it and do it with class and style. Thank you for listening to me.